uh, great pleasure to be uh, to be here. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for for being around. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, our speakers and this panel. Uh, we have uh, uh, Kim Clausing, who's a professor of uh, economics and law at UCLA Law School, and uh, recently served as a deputy assistant secretary for tax policy uh, in the Biden administration. Uh, we're also joined remotely by uh, Zach Lisko, who's a uh, uh, law professor at uh, Yale Law School and is currently serving as a chief economist of the Office of Management and Budget. And uh, we are also joined, uh, we also have uh, Juliana Londono Velez with us. Uh, and Juliana is an assistant professor of economics at UCLA. So uh, we'll start with, uh, and I am uh, Gabriel uh, Zachman. I'm a professor of economics at the Paris School of Economics and UC Berkeley and director of the EU Tax Observatory. So we'll start with uh, Zach and then Kim and me and then Juliana, uh, 10 minutes each. Uh, no slides for this uh, session and we very much look forward to the, to the discussion. Zach, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here remotely with you. Uh, like Gabriel said, I'm normally a professor at Yale Law School, but currently a chief economist at the White House Office of Management and Budget. I should say I'm speaking on behalf of the administration today, not myself. Uh, so uh, what Gabriel wanted me to do was tell you about the administration's tax plan, which was just submitted a couple of weeks ago to Congress. Uh, overall, I'd say that it promotes inclusive prosperity. In fact, I would say that the Biden administration is the administration for inclusive prosperity. Uh, and in some cases, uh, many, many cases, building on the work of, of folks in this room and involved with ESEP. So thanks a lot for your important work. So let me start with some context on the budget. The president has committed to not raising statutory rates on anyone earning under $400,000. So that leaves the well-off, those earning above $400,000 and, and businesses. Uh, Overall, the budget proposes about $4.5 trillion in new uh, taxes over the next decade. Uh, and along with uh, $500 billion in saved interest costs, these tax increases would pay for about $3 trillion in deficit reductions and about $2 trillion uh, in largely new social spending like childcare, education, pre-K education, uh, housing, and paid parental leave. Uh, so what are these taxes? So about $1.3 trillion of this comes from raising the corporate tax rate back up to 28%, which is still far below the 35% rate that we have for decades, and notably that we have for decades without you know, any catastrophic harm to the U.S. economy. About a trillion dollars is from reform to the multinational tax system, uh, which Kim is going to talk about. Uh, and third, about a uh, trillion or so is from taxing capital on the individual side, including, I, I think, some innovative tax policies that I'm going to talk some more about in detail. Uh, in particular, I'm going to uh, talk about these one particular proposal for taxing capital. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to describe a couple other proposals for taxing capital that are in there. First, uh, we're going to raise, we propose raising the capital gains rate uh, to equal the ordinary tax rate uh, that people pay on wages, which is uh, 39%. We're also proposing an excise tax on share of purchases, uh, which is that was that's now at 1%, we'd raise that to 4%. And third, we would tax capital gains at death for the well-off, for those who have about, for couples that have about $10 million in assets. Uh, but we're also doing, uh, like I said, I think some innovative tax policy. What I want to talk in particular about is the billionaire minimum income tax. So this is a tax on assets that have gone up in value, that have not been sold yet. And it's limited to those with over $100 million in wealth. So this is just you know, the very, very tippy top of the wealth distribution. Let me take a step back and talk about wealth in America. So among America's uh, wealthiest families, a lot of them founded companies or otherwise have stock that has just gone up a huge amount in value. Many of them borrow against this wealth and are thus essentially consume it. Uh, they just have you know, billions of dollars of, in revolving credit lines. And then what they do is they die and they, in fact, never pay taxes 
on those, of those gains uh, in, in stocks, even though they have, in fact, consumed billions of dollars uh, on you know, mega yachts and mega homes over the course uh, of their lifetimes. Now, we think that this is, is unfair. Now, when workers earn and consume, they pay tax, uh, but owners of wealth uh, do not. And this seems unfair, especially since the owners of wealth tend to be very, very rich. Furthermore, based on recent optimal tax work, uh, it's increasingly seeming inefficient to have such low taxes on capital versus much higher taxes on labor. In fact, uh, as any tax law class would teach, uh, we would say that no matter how you get richer, whether it's as wage income or unsold capital gains, these should both conceptually count as income. Uh, and it makes sense to do this because these gains can be consumed just as easily as labor through, through borrowing, or as labor income through borrowing. So with this definition of income, the average income tax rate of the richest 400 families in the United States is just 8%, you know, 8%. And that's wildly unfair. That's a way lower rate than a typical middle-class uh, income tax rate. Uh, and this seems uh, very wrong. So we introduced the billionaire minimum income tax. What this does is it taxes these gains under this more sensible definition of income, including unsold gains on assets like stocks. And it raises $437 billion, $437 billion over 10 years. And it's important to emphasize here that this is not a wealth tax. It's a tax on gains, on increases in the value of your assets, not a tax on the stock of wealth. Uh, I want to make a pitch at this point for the value of actually working out the details of a policy under real world economic and policy constraints. So I've just told you how this tax would work at the high level, at a high level. You've got Mark Zuckerberg, his, uh, his assets have gone up by tens of billions of dollars in value, and we're going to tax that even though he hasn't sold it yet. That's the proposal. In fact, though, uh, this leaves out a lot of details. Uh, that are unspecified, even if it makes sense to you uh, at, a, at, a high level, at a high level of an abstraction, there's still lots of details to work out. So for example, uh, one, how quickly would taxpayers have to pay, including for their uh, past gains? So would Zuckerberg have to pay 25% of all those gains this year, the 25% tax rate, should he have to pay now? Well, what we said is that you'd have to pay over nine years. This helps deal with uh, you know, avoiding that very large tax bill up front, which could be an inconvenience possibly even on someone like Zuckerberg. And it also helps deal with uh, volatility over time. So spreading it out means that as your wealth changes year to year, you won't have these big swings in how much you owe. Second difficulty is how to deal with illiquid assets. So I've been talking about stocks thus far. Stocks are easy to value. We know how much we know how much they're worth, they're easy to buy, easy to sell. Some people don't have assets that are so easy to value or easy to buy or easy to sell, such as a privately held business. So what we said is that for that select portion, they can be sold with interest uh, upon sale to avoid the big inconvenience of, of owners of businesses uh, having to value them and you know having to possibly borrow at inconvenient amounts against their, against their businesses. A third issue is uh, refundability. So what if you, you, know, you paid a bunch of money, uh, because your stock's not a bunch, and then they go down in value a lot. What should we do about that? Now, again, that's gonna be pretty rare because we're just phasing in this tax over time. Uh, but uh, we wanted to allow, we do in fact allow refundability on consistency grounds. If your stocks go up, you pay. If your stocks go down, uh, you get refunded. They want it to be uh, parallel, and et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of implementation details you'd want to work out in a new policy like this. Uh, and ultimately, something like this is going to be pretty important if you want to actually tax these folks who are only paying 8% among the 400 richest families. So I want to return now to where I started, uh, developing research on taxes for inclusive prosperity. History suggests that by including this proposal in the budget, it's much more likely to be enacted. Uh, folks are talking about it in Congress. When the OMB director testified in Congress in the last couple of weeks, 
it came up uh, each day. Republicans uh, seem actually afraid of it enough that they are uh, ha having ads in, in uh, a few states to, to whip up opposition to it. So this is uh, just by virtue of, have, of creating this, creating a real policy proposal and elevating it in the budget. Uh, I think that this is something that uh, will happen sooner or later. But I want to point out how it builds on important economics research. And I, I want to list three. First uh, is the optimal tax literature over the last two decades, uh, which has overturned this older idea that, tax, uh, that capital should be taxed at low or even zero rates. Uh, I think there's lots of reason to think that it should be taxed at you know, perhaps roughly what, the, uh, what wage income, what labor income is taxed at. And that's obviously crucial for all this because if capital should be taxed at very low rates, we wouldn't want to do something like this. Second uh, is work on public attitude on taxing capital. Uh, my co-author Ed Fox and I uh, did this work. Uh, we took a representative sample of, of 5,000 Americans to understand their intuitions about taxing unsold gains. And we had dozens of scenarios and randomized information treatments. And we probed how folks uh, think about taxing unsold gains and capital in general. From this, we learned uh, what policy designs are most palatable and that uh, played a role in developing the policy. And third uh, was work done by uh, Gabriel uh, Emanuel and Danny Gigan uh, to help actually help design the guts of this. And they have you know, an excellent uh, white paper, not something that's gonna ever be published uh, and you know, taught by the economics journal, uh, but you know, it was really important to, to establish the groundwork uh, externally for, for the administration to help build on. And I wanna say that that work was, uh, was, was very valuable and important. And overall, just a lot of people of, uh, a lot of people put work into this, both uh, academics as well as, as in the administration and came up with uh, what we think is an implementable fully sized proposal that, uh, you know, that you know, does not have all these details that you know, are, are kind of left unspecified for the future. Rather, I, this would work, I think, as designed. Uh, and I think this is exactly the kind of thing that EFIP, uh, or one of those types of things that EFIP is trying to promote. Now, of course, this, uh, the billionaire minimum income tax is not enacted yet, uh, but for the well-off to pay their fair share, I expect that we're going to need something like this sooner or later. This is just the form uh, of wealth that, uh, that the richest Americans have, and we'll need something like it if they're going to pay, uh, if they're going to pay taxes, taxes like the rest of us do. Uh, so with that, uh, thanks so much, and I'm looking really looking forward to from hearing uh, from the rest of this uh, really great panel. Thanks. Thanks, Gabriel, for the introduction and for inviting me and for organizing this conference together with uh, the others. I'm going to talk a little bit about the rationale for the international tax agreement and international tax cooperation uh, writ large. In 2021, more than 135 countries agreed on a political agreement to transform the future of international taxation. And this, these countries represent about 95% of the world economy. And beyond that political agreement, there's been a movement towards implementing the minimum tax um, with the EU, the UK, South Korea, Japan, and other key countries taking important steps. So the basic parameters of this agreement are twofold. The one that I'm going to focus on most is actually called Pillar 2, and under Pillar 2, there would be a country-by-country country minimum tax of 15% on multinational company income, regardless of where it was um, reported. There's also a Pillar 1 agreement that would reallocate some of the taxing rights toward the market jurisdiction. And my remarks are going to focus on the need for this type of international tax reform, not the reform itself, which Gabriel will delve into in more detail. Um, but the first part of understanding why we need this kind of international tax reform is to realize that the international tax system beforehand was built on a foundation that is completely intellectually bankrupt. 
In particular, um, countries realize that that foundation was flawed and flawed beyond incremental repair because it was based on this fiction of the arm's length standard. And under the arm's length standard, multinational companies are supposed to allocate their profits as if they were interacting with people at arm's length. But in reality, um, they used uh, you know, a variety of, of techniques um, in a lax regulatory environment um, that was filled with special tax regimes to move income to very lightly taxed jurisdictions. And this was easy in part because the global nature of economic activity and the intangible nature of economic value and the complicitness of government regulatory regimes made it easy um, to move income to very light tax jurisdictions. At the same time, governments were part of the problem and they worked against their own joint interests. Um, given this mobility of international capital and the mobility of the tax base itself, governments were fearful of loss of tax revenue, loss of jobs, loss of investment. And so they competed with each other, lowering corporate taxes time and time again throughout the world. And this race to the bottom in, in corporate tax is definitely an example of what we all know as a prisoner's dilemma, where um, governments thinking only of their own interests had an incentive to lower their tax rate to either keep or attract tax base. But if they could coordinate with others, they might find that the optimal um, tax rates would be higher. And these uncoordinated policy actions really actually interfered with tax sovereignty. Even if a government wanted to tax capital income in the corporate form, it would have difficulty doing so because the tax base was so mobile. And even if they tried to do it, they would be racked with competitiveness concerns because the business would come to the government and say, you can't single-handedly solve this problem because we will lose out to companies based in countries that aren't interested in solving this problem. So the tax agreement was very important because it allowed a coordinated response where governments could say together, listen, we're gonna do this collectively, we're gonna raise that bottom from zero to 15%. And the agreement has at least the potential to really deliver three key desiderata um, that you know, people in this room care about. One, defending the tax base from tax base erosion. Two, creating a more fair tax system. And three, creating a more efficient tax system. So I'm gonna focus on those three things. So first, let's talk about tax base erosion. Under the status quo, there were very large discrepancies between where companies were doing activity and where they were booking their profits. So if you look at where they did activities, it was in the usual suspect big countries uh, like China and the United States, Japan, India, Europe. Um, but if you look at where they book their profits, it was disproportionately in these very low tax jurisdictions. And because of that, you saw big differences in profits per employee um, across US multinational companies, for instance. When US multinationals operate in China or Germany or the UK, they have about ten dollars to $20,000 of profit per employee. When they operate in Ireland or Switzerland or Singapore, they have about $600,000 of profit per employee. When they operate in the Caymans or Bermuda, they tend to have uh, more like tens of millions of dollars of profits per employee. Uh, in, in 2017 in Bermuda, each employee generated $60 million of profit. That's 2,000 times the profitability of an employee in Canada. Like we don't actually think Bermuda is that special. Um, <laughs> So due to this enormous tax base mobility, um, historically high corporate profits, which were high throughout the world and increasing over this time period, often generated only flat corporate tax revenues or sometimes, as in the United States, declining corporate tax revenues. Now, researchers disagree about exactly how large um, this problem is, but there is a consensus that it's quite large. Um, for example, the OECD has recently released annual estimates of revenue gains from this pillar two minimum tax of $220 billion per year. Now that's shared you know, throughout the, the countries that adopt this tax reform. Um, they have access to some of the best sources of data, um, and given the large role of U.S. multinationals in the world economies, some part of that, of course, is from the taxation of U.S. multinationals. If you look at a more ambitious reform, such as the one that the Biden administration suggested that would be a country by country at a slightly higher rate, um, you get for, for the U.S. about a half a trillion dollars in revenue over the 10-year budget window. That's very substantial. Um, and that's uh, pretty uniformly estimated to be in roughly that magnitude, whether you look at the American Enterprise Institute or Tax Policy Center or Joint Committee on Tax or Treasury, they all kind of agree that it's in that neighborhood. 
So these, these reforms are very essential for revenue. This is also true for developing countries. In developing countries, while their absolute magnitudes are lower, the share that they're losing in corporate tax base from profit shifting is, is higher as a share of their economy than is in rich countries. And if we look at the potential for minimum taxation for developing countries, it's twofold. One, it will help them defend their tax base because the incentive to shift out will be less if the alternative is 15 instead of zero. And two, it's a simpler tax base because you just have to calculate the effective tax rate and then top it up. You don't have to worry necessarily about quite as many detailed uh, rules and complexity that the, the current system has. So as a second key component to um, the reason to have this kind of international tax agreement is that of fairness. Um, when Larry Summers wrote an op-ed about this agreement at the end of 2021. He called it a triumph of Detroit over Davos. And what he meant by that is that the agreement isn't centered on business interests per se, but on societal interests. And at the core, the principle that tax burdens should be more fairly shared, and they will be more fairly shared if governments can tax mobile capital. Um, and this is particularly important in recent decades because just as we've seen increased income inequality as, as Gabriel and his colleagues' work has shown so persuasively, we've also seen tax system move away from taxing capital and towards taxing labor or consumption. So at the same time that really we should be trying to counter some of these increased in income inequalities through a more progressive system, we've adopted a less progressive system. So, um, you know, being able to tax corporate income is very important because capital, as we know, is much more concentrated at the top of the income distribution than is labor income. Um, Treasury data suggests for the top 1% of households, they have 12% of labor income, which granted is disproportionate, but they have 52% of positive capital income for the United States. So that, that shows you how important that concentration is. It's also important to note that if we want to tax capital income at all, that the business entity level is the place to start. So even if Zach and his colleagues in the administration get their way and we can tax unrealized gains, we have to recognize that a lot of US equity income and equity income throughout the world is, goes completely untaxed at the individual level for a number of reasons. It might be in the hands of foreigners that uh, the domestic government can't tax. It might be in the Harvard Endowment, where it doesn't get taxed. It might be in pensions and retirement accounts, where it doesn't get taxed. And even if you look at the taxable accounts, which in the US equity is less than 30% of, of, of total accounts, um, you do have this ability to defer taxation until realization or even postpone it indefinitely at death. So to have a fair tax system, I think you need to be able to tax business income, and, and corporate income is a big part of that. Um, an, ad uh, an additional element of fairness gets to my last point, which is that this can also be an important aspect of an efficient tax system, which is that at present we're taxing multinational companies at lower rates than we're taxing smaller businesses. And that tilts the competitive playing field kind of away from the more competitive um, companies and firms, the smaller businesses, um, in favor of the big multinational companies. And this has become an, an issue uh, lately, in particular, because market power is, is becoming a larger and larger part of, of our economy, as we'll see in some sessions um, later. So, um, if anything, we want the tax system to do the opposite, <laughs> to put a thumb on the scale and the, against market power, but we have a tax system that's actually promoting market power by giving multinational companies, you know, lighter tax rates than others. So. Um, you know, economic theory suggests that taxing rents is much more efficient than taxing the normal return to capital. And one interesting feature of the world that we live in right now is the corporate tax base is mostly rents. If you look at research by treasury economists, by uh, Ed Fox, who was referenced in the last presentation, by two groups of IMF economists, they all conclude that the corporate tax base, the vast majority of it is above normal returns to capital or excess returns to capital. For instance, um, one IMF study found that even if you use a threshold of a 10% return on assets as normal, which I think is above normal, right, you get 70% of the, the corporate tax base being above normal returns. So if we get a way to tax um, multinational company profits, right, we have 
a fairer tax, we have more revenue, but we also have a more efficient tax because we're taxing something that's less distortionary. And one of the things that's prevented that in the, in the past is this concern for the international mobility of that tax base, the fear that if you raise taxes on those multinational companies, they'll just move the profit offshore. And so that's why it makes this international agreement, I think, so important, um, is that it has the ability to, to really buttress that tax base. So in short, by overcoming a global collective action problem and buttressing tax fairness, efficiency, and revenue, the agreement can be a, a big improvement for all countries. That doesn't mean that consensus is going to be easy, and that doesn't mean the agreement will be as, busy, as ambitious as it should be, but I think it's certainly a step towards fairer tax systems. So I'll leave it at that. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I'd like to try to put the uh, proposals and the developments that Zach uh, and Kim mentioned into perspective so that we all understand both their importance but also their limitations. And the starting point of, of my remark is that um, we, we live in, in tax systems today that are largely creations of the 1950s. Why is that? It's because if you look globally at the main sources of tax revenues, essentially about half of global tax revenues come from two taxes, the VAT, value added tax, and payroll taxes. Value added tax, all countries have a value added tax except the US. The US has lots of consumption taxes you know, at the state and local level that somewhat mimic a VAT, but are very large or so. Uh, the VAT itself uh, was invented and first experimented in, in France in the 1960s. And you know, it's one of these great French exports like, like wine and cheese. It caught fire, all, almost all countries uh, adopted it, and now it's a, it's a major source of tax revenues uh, everywhere. Payroll taxes, which are taxes on wage income, uh, are a bit older, but they became really big just after World War II to fund you know, uh, the welfare state, the social state, the retirement system, healthcare, and so on. Now, the characteristics of these taxes, the VAT, the payroll taxes, is that um, they are flat taxes, they are not progressive, they are taxes on consumption for the VAT, so they exempt saving, there are taxes on labor income, you know, payroll taxes, they exempt capital income. And so all of that, you know, funding government revenues primarily by flat taxes, exempting saving, exempting capital income, made some sense, made even a lot of sense in the post-World War II context, especially the European post-World War II context when capital was scarce, inequality was at a relatively low level. But uh, today, the, the context is really the opposite. Uh, capital has been making a comeback. You know, if you look at ratios of capital to income, they're much larger today than in the 50s, 60s. Uh, the capital share of national income has been rising. The labor share has been falling. And of course, inequality of income and wealth has been rising in many countries. And so the, conclu the conclusion from that is, you know, we, we are stuck with these old tax systems that, that made sense 70 years ago, but today we really need to invent new forms of taxation that are going to be adapted to the inequality challenges of the 21st century. And that means, you know, taxing, among other things, taxing capital. Now, when you say that, the immediate response is uh, this view that taxing capital in a globalized world uh, is not possible. Because if you do that, firms will move profits to Bermuda, high income and wealthy individuals will move to tax havens and so on. But what's really important to understand is that tax competition uh, is not a law of nature, you know, like gravity. It's, it's a policy choice. And we can choose as, as nations to embrace or even to encourage tax competition, just like we can choose coordination 
and uh, harmonization. And the choice that's been made since the 1980s, frankly, not a very democratically debated and very transparent choice, but the choice that was made was the choice to, to embrace tax competition, and of course, other choices are possible. And indeed, the proof that other choices are possible is that we are starting to make other choices. Um, uh, there has been major progress in terms of information exchange across countries. 10, 15 years ago, there was a complete bank secrecy. Today, bankers in offshore financial centers are supposed to send information about their clients and their assets automatically to all or most of the world's countries' uh, tax authorities. That's a major progress. And there is the agreement uh, uh, on a minimum corporate tax of 15 uh, percent, you know what Kim uh, described and what is known as the uh, pillar two of the uh, of the OECD deal. Now, I'd like to emphasize that this is a really an important step, in the sense that it's the first time that there is or there will be. Uh, some form of international agreement that puts a floor to how low tax rates can go. It's the first time that there's an international agreement about tax rates. We have all sorts of agreements about everything, about trade, about even the definition of the tax base, you know, what should be counted as profits, how should profits be allocated across countries. But of course, the most important element of taxation is really the tax rate. And for the first time, you know what what countries are saying is that for some forms of income some parts of corporate profits the effective rate shouldn't go below 15% and that's a really important you know step towards uh, uh more cooperation and ultimately a, a more effective taxation of capital at the same time it's really uh insufficient and in fact severely flawed in in two important dimensions Number one is that the tax rate, 15%, is, is very low. Okay, so uh, it's not very hard to understand. In the US, the uh, ratio of total taxes to national income is around 28%. When you try to allocate all taxes to the different income groups, what you see is that pretty much all the groups of the distribution, the working class, the middle class, the upper middle class, pay about 28% of their income in taxes, you know, all taxes included, income tax, payroll tax, corporate taxes, and so on. With one big exception, which you know, is the billionaires, you know, as Zach mentioned, uh, uh, the, the work of the, of, the, of the White House you know, in estimating effective tax rates uh, by billionaires, 8%, you know, depending on how you count things, you can obtain slightly different numbers, but I think everybody agrees that the effective tax rate for the super rich in the US is way below 28%. And now, in that context, where almost all the social groups pay 28%, saying, well, for multinational companies, the most powerful economic actors, those who've most benefited from globalization, that for them, 15% is okay, is, of course, you know, uh, difficult to understand by, by many people. The other issue, which is a somewhat more technical issue, but in fact an even bigger problem, is more of a, of a philosophical flaw with the agreement, is that um, uh, this uh, minimum tax is not going to end uh, tax competition or the race to the bottom with corporate taxation. For those of you who followed those discussions, maybe you remember that at the beginning of the Biden administration, there was a lot of talking about how you know uh, it, uh, the administration wanted to put an end to the race to the bottom with corporate tax rate, an end to tax competition, and so on. What the agreement does is it says, well, if a company, like you know, in 2019, Alphabet booked more than $10 billion in, in Bermuda, where the corporate tax rate is, uh, is you know, a relatively low rate of 0%. It, in, it did that, now it's not going to be possible to do that in the future because those profits in territories or in countries where there is no economic substance will be subject to a 15% minimum tax. However, uh, what the agreement says is that if, if uh, companies book profits in places where they have real activity, capital, office space, you know, headquarters, where production happens, then the corresponding profits, for the most part, will be exempt from the minimum tax. 
the philosophical underpinning, you know, the, the view that legitimizes this is to say that you know, artificial profit shifting, moving profits to Bermuda or the Cayman Islands is not legitimate and there should be a floor, you know, 15%. But real tax competition, uh, firms moving production to low tax places, that's legitimate and there shouldn't be any floor. You know, any tax rate is okay, even 0%. And the problem, and I'll end there, is that international tax competition is a very negative form of international competition. You know, it's a form of international competition that primarily benefits multinational companies and their shareholders who tend to be at the top of the wealth distribution. So it fuels inequality. There are other forms of international competition that are positive forms of competition. We should all be competing to be the first country to arrive at net zero carbon emission. That's great. Uh, we should compete to have the best infrastructure, to have the best universities, to have the best healthcare system. Those forms of international competition, you know, they benefit uh, the population at large, you know, the middle class, the working class, and so on. International tax competition, not at all. You know, it just fuels inequality. And the problem with this agreement is that it, in fact, embraces and legitimizes international tax competition. And I think for the future, it will be very important to address that issue. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Juliana. And I was asked to come and talk about wealth taxes in this session. So um, progressive wealth taxation has received a renewed interest as a tool to both raise revenue and curb inequality. And when thinking about wealth taxes, economists have usually turned to the experience of European countries um, that have had or that had taxes in the 1990s up until the 2000s uh, to learn about what are the strengths and the weaknesses of taxing wealth. And what I'm going to do today is argue that we can also learn from the experiences of developing countries in taxing wealth. Um, several Latin American countries currently have wealth taxes. Uh, and why should we think about Latin America, it's a region you know, that on average GDP per capita is much lower, but the thing, it's a region with high inequality. And so if you start looking at the very top, top 1%, top 0.01%, um, they're starting to look pretty similar to European countries, including France. And in addition, it's a region that actually has high quality administrative data and policy variation that has fostered new research on wealth taxation and enforcing wealth taxes in a globalized world. And so let's start with one question, is it wealth taxes, are they enforceable? Well, some experts contend that wealth taxes usually raise very little rubber because the high exemption thresholds traditionally exclude more than 99% of taxpayers. Um, and partly because enforcing taxes is notoriously challenging. You know, we've already heard some of these challenges, but let's just reiterate them. One is it's really hard to value some assets if they're not reported in tax records at market values. Um, and in addition, some, some types of assets are just inherently hard to value, like closely held private businesses. In addition, we have the issue that it's just generally hard to identify assets that are owned by taxpayers. Um, governments can use third party reported information um, by banks and financial institutions on clients' financial assets, like bank statements, but Many other assets are simply not third party reported and can be very easily underreported. Let's talk about foreign assets. So foreign assets are predominantly held by the wealthiest individuals and they've been historically hard to observe. Um, there's been recent um, automatic tax information exchange agreements that can help shed light on offshore financial accounts. And the OECD's common reporting standards or CRS, which has been adopted by over 100 jurisdictions is a welcome step in the right direction but there are limitations and perhaps surprisingly, an important one is actually coming from the United States. Uh, the US has made it very clear that it doesn't currently intend to adopt the CRS um, and it doesn't tend, intend to abandon the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act or FATCA. And while it was certainly revolutionary when it was signed into law in 2010, FATCA reporting is much more limited than the required reporting under the CRS today. And so this is problematic for various reasons. I'll just mention two of them. Two examples is one, FATCA doesn't provide information about the account balances in interest-bearing accounts. Think about deposits and savings account. It only shares information on interest income. 
And so in other words, the US doesn't report to other countries information on wealth, only on income, and only certain kinds of income, interest, and only certain types of interest income, more than 10 or more dollars. And so this can include a lot of accounts. Um, by contrast, the CRS, which has been adopted by most other countries, includes reporting balances for all accounts, regardless of the income source. And so this useful information, by the way, is being received by the IRS, and it helps the US enforce its own taxes, just not the other way around. The second issue is, um, the, in terms of the reporting requirements, is that the CRS requires identifying and reporting the account holders and the controlling persons. Uh, and so jurisdictions are receiving the full names, the full addresses, the tax identification number, or TINs, the account number, the balance of the account holder. FATCA doesn't. And the taxpayer information, or TIN, is usually missing. And so part of the reason was why the US can't give its reciprocal partners this information is because the information is not currently reported by the, to, to the IRS by the financial institutions. And so these limitations restrict developed and developing countries' ability to track residents' foreign accounts and protect their tax base if, like some wealth taxing countries, um, they consider foreign wealth taxable. And so the argument, you know, when you talk about with tax authorities, they say, like, forget about the British Virgin Islands, let's forget about uh, Switzerland, forget about Panama. It's the United States our issue right now. Um, the U.S., I think you've, we've heard this already, is becoming the world's new tax haven uh, because it's creating opportunities for evasion for foreigners who can evade taxes um, that they owe in their own home countries by simply parking wealth in unreported funds in U.S. financial institutions. And so it's a very one-sided approach that's hurtful. Um, and it's important to think about this when we think about capital taxation. Another issue is that foreign real estate is excluded from all of these multilateral agreements. And many wealthy individuals own foreign real estate. There's a lot of Latin Americans with housing in Miami. And these authorities are still unable to observe a significant portion of foreign wealth. And the evidence um, by Gabriel and co-authors is that this is big and it's a growing problem, not only for tax evasion purposes, but also because opacity breeds certain activities like money laundering and corruption that can negatively impact society. And so these issues that are faced by wealth taxing countries, both developed and developing, are more, can be more severe in the developing world. One reason for that is that property taxes are generally based on outdated cadastral values, and property transactions are rarely used to up these, update these values. The value of other assets is based on historical values that are not aligned with the market values of the assets. They also have less tax capacity, meaning less resources to do tax audits. They usually don't have um, dedicated units to follow high net wealth taxpayers. Um, assets can be severely underdeclared because of the pervasiveness of the shadow or underground or informal economy. Another important issue is that the rich in developing countries like Latin America are especially prone to offshore evasion. And so by some estimates, the equivalent of 13% of all of Latin America's GDP is held overseas which is above the world average, around 10%. And the share increases to 26% for Brazil, 37% for Argentina, 65% for Venezuela. And many beneficial owners in the leaked Pandora papers that we heard about were from Latin America, especially from these three countries, Argentina, Brazil, and Venezuela. And so how can we compare international offshore tax evasion across like places? Well, these international comparisons are very hard to come by, but what we do know is that for instance, two in every five Colombians in the top 0.01% of the wealth distribution confessed to having evaded um, by hiding wealth offshore. That's about three times as much as in Scandinavia, about four times as much in the Netherlands. But crucially, these enforcement challenges aren't unique to wealth taxation, and there are many challenges in taxing wealth transfers, namely estate taxations, inheritance tax, um, capital income, we just talked about corporate taxation, um, and real property in developed and developing countries. Here's some examples. The estate and gift taxes in the United States collects very little revenue because of tax loophole like the step up in basis um, and a high exemption threshold that exclude all but a few thousand taxpayers every year. 
Numerous studies have shown that a lack of verifiable paper trails also make the income and value added taxes that are difficult to enforce. Weak cadastres I mentioned will erode not only wealth tax, but also the property tax basis um, in many countries, and that's a main source of revenue for local governments. And as we discussed, tax havens pose a global threat to capital taxation. And so despite these weaknesses, it may be surprising to learn that Latin America still imposes wealth taxes. Um, and so let's think about why that's the case. Well, historically, countries have taxed wealth because it may be easier to observe assets like housing or land um, than income, which is a flow. And so indeed, Latin America has a long tradition of taxing the wealth of individuals and firms precisely for this reason. And some of the arguments have to actually come up today, which is that um, well, wealth tax, one thing that is different is that wealth taxes in these countries were actually not brought about by some leftist movement concerned for progressive redistribution to curtail inequality, but actually by very practical concerns about income tax evasion. The fact that they, there would be very wealthy people just surprisingly declaring very little income. Um, and the need to secure revenue to, to fund public goods. Um, and so the argument, uh, you know, when you read the literature from political economy, um, why is it that the rich in, in Latin America supported wealth taxes? And part of the reason is that they saw, they supported them when they saw the consolidation of the central state as advancing their own interests. And for example, in the case of Colombia, the Colombian elite supported reintroducing the wealth tax. This is created in the 30s, abolished in the 90s, and then reintroduced in 2002 when a center right-wing government that year proposed having a temporary wealth tax to finance the exigencies of war against illegal armed groups. And so it's a combination of fiscal crisis and security crisis coupled with improving perceptions of government provision of public safety that generated cohesion among business and government elites in favor of a wealth tax. And so what's interesting is that while rich countries progressively seem to have given up on taxing wealth in the 1990s and early 2000s, the wealth taxes are very much alive and well in Latin America. Argentina, Colombia, and Uruguay currently levy wealth taxes annually, and uh, Bolivia and Ecuador have implemented temporary wealth taxes in the COVID-19 pandemic aftermath. Um, moreover, several countries like Brazil, even though they don't have a wealth tax, they still require all income taxpayers to report their assets and their liabilities annually to support income tax enforcement because, as I just mentioned, the mandatory wealth reporting enables authorities to simply see if any change in a taxpayer's net worth is compatible with whatever they reported in income. And so given the weaknesses that I've just mentioned in terms of enforcing wealth taxes, why do wealth taxes still exist in Latin America? Well, I'll give you four reasons. One is that wealth taxes have been used and are still used to complement um, the ineffective taxation of personal income, the ineffective taxation of the bequests and gift taxes, and the ineffective taxation of um, capital income and property. Second is that there's high levels of income and wealth inequality in the region that make it possible to actually generate some revenue by taxing wealth. There is generally political support for wealth taxes, uh, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic. And the last, and I think is an important point, is that you can strengthen the enforcement regime, and that can increase reported wealth and improve tax progressivity, even in settings that have a low baseline tax compliance. And so this gives me to the last point, which is that this pervasiveness of offshore tax evasion that I mentioned has prompted many countries to conduct a series of enforcement initiatives in the last years to improve wealthy taxpayers' tax compliance. So I mentioned the common reporting standard to trace taxpayers' foreign income and assets, and many Latin American countries unlike the United States, are part of the CRS for the automatic exchanges of information on financial accounts, um, which facilitates detecting certain kinds of offshore tax evasion. They've also improved transparency. Many countries, including like Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, Uruguay, and recently Colombia, have already have or are making progress in building a registry of the ultimate beneficial owner of companies, trusts, and other legal arrangements for tax, as well as for anti-money laundering purposes following international standards. Many countries have also implemented voluntary disclosure programs or tax amnesties. And the idea between these, behind these programs is to entice wealthy taxpayers to disclose their foreign incomes and assets in exchange for reduced penalties and no prosecution. And recent research um, 
shows that these enforcement policies that um, have contributed to boosting um, tax revenue and improving tax compliance at the very top. I'll give two examples from Colombia and Argentina. Colombia in 2015, the government implemented a program to entice wealthy individuals to disclose their hidden wealth, and the program was highly successful and recovered equivalent to 1.73% of GDP, which is significantly more than what the US program uh, recovered some years earlier. And importantly, the program significantly improved tax compliance. Three years after their disclosures, people reported 49% more wealth, and by virtue of reporting also the return on that wealth, they also reported 40% um, more income, so that led to an increase in income taxes too. Um, and because these disclosures are taking place at the very top of the, the distribution, that made the system more progressive overall. Argentina is another interesting example. Argentina also taxes wealth annually, and it also has sought to crack down on offshore tax evasion to boost tax collection and social spending. And it's a country where, despite its efforts to have um, tax amnesties, um, they were unsuccessful. In 2016, there was an amnesty that was actually quite successful with wealthy Argentines disclosing assets around 20% of GDP. Um, this amnesty, and perhaps in combination with these automatic exchanges of information that I've mentioned, led to an increase in reported assets by the wealthiest 0.1% of adults. Four years after the amnesty, this group reported owning around two to three times more assets than before the program. And therefore, the wealth and the capital income tax base is more than doubled overnight. And as a result of these disclosures, today Argentines report that around a half of all their wealth is offshore which aligns much more closely to what we thought based on macro estimates of offshore wealth. In addition, these expanded wealth tax base have allowed authorities to collect more revenue um, um, by subsequently taxing foreign assets at very high rates. And this turned out to be quite handy for them when they needed additional revenues to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so to conclude, I think the findings that we see emerging from various countries suggest that we can enforce tax laws. Um, it's possible. Um, to have progressive taxation on capital in today's globalized world. And this is true even in situations where there is high inequality and many people do not comply with tax laws. Thanks. A question to to Gabriel. Um, you were um, you were quite negative on the idea that uh, would allow different countries to apply different uh, rates of capital taxation in those cases where there's um, a real production base, right? So um, let's leave aside the, just the um, uh, you know paper booking of profits. Now, because the the original, your first objection, 15% is very low, so um, this is not a real issue. But is there, if it were much higher, suppose it's 30%, it's 40%, would you see a benefit to that, to that allowing that diversity for the reason that um, you said earlier that there was, you know, even in today's advanced countries, there was an argument why capital uh, taxation might need to be low because you need to accumulate, save. In many developing countries, there's an argument for wanting to um, essentially attract foreign capital for a variety of reasons. And there might be legitimate reasons they may, they may want to apply a lower capital tax rate. Um, and that seems to be a contending value at in tension with the, uh, with the objective of, of uh, global harmonization. How, how would you think of that? Yeah, 
I just wanted to add to the problem Gabriel mentioned already with the OECD problem. I, I think one of the other concerns is that this basically means all countries have to agree to... I, say, I cannot hear the question. Hi, sorry. Okay, I just wanted to add to uh, Gabriel's concerns about the OECD tax compromise. Uh, one of the big concerns is that all countries have to agree to give up any autonomous taxing rights for corporations. And this particularly matters where, for example, they've instituted digital taxes and so on. And, and we know that developing countries, for example, are getting a pitiful fraction of what they otherwise would have got because of the way the compromise has I mean, the small print, which has basically removed all the tax amounts. And so if you remove all of that, and if you do any domestic policy, you're subject to investor state dispute settlement, which is huge. So it makes you wonder whether this is really a step forward or whether it would be better to move sideways and into a UN process that would take account of these. Yeah. Just uh, to fire the uh, pile on to Gabriel, I would ask him to address the problem that the tier one and tier two have brought out. Many of the OECD countries felt that the profit that stems from the sale of an intangible product should be taxed by the place where it is sold as opposed to the place where it was invented. And I've objected to the royalties charged by this often a convenient island, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, that would lower the tax base in, in the uh, the people functions uh, area. Uh, the problem uh, that you point out to with uh, $10 billion per employee uh, in Bermuda or whatever the number was, that has to really be a problem. In transfer pricing, when the intangible is exported from the U.S. to Bermuda, and that's a U.S. problem. But I do think that there has been, and it's been a little bit unfair to U.S. companies, a piling on against the application or the profit from intangibles invented one place but sold in another place. So if you could address that, I'd appreciate it. So I have a few thoughts on many of those. Um, the substance-based carve-out, I would agree with Gabriel, is a problem in the sense that, um, you know, the ideally we wouldn't encourage the shifting of substance for tax reasons. And so you might actually displace one form of tax competition with what might be a more harmful one. I would point out, though, that it's extremely difficult to reach consensus with 95% of the world economy on this. And this was a sticking point. And I don't think we'd have an agreement at all without that. So I guess the question is, is this one step forward? or not, right? Um, and with respect to your argument about the DSTs and the UN and Pillar 1, I think that's very important. I kind of ignored Pillar 1 in my remarks. Um, I don't suspect Pillar 1 is going to reach a swift conclusion the way that Pillar 2 did. And so then the question is, do we then return to, you know, a land where there's a lot of DSTs, which which come with some of their own difficulties, of course, um, you know, or, or do we eventually come to some other kind of compromise, right? And, and I think that's an important one. I agree that the tax system encourages debt too much, and that also makes it such that our corporate tax system actually subsidizes a lot of capital. Um, so that some investments that wouldn't be worth doing on a pre-tax basis are worth doing on a post-tax basis. So I think that's extremely problematic. Um, and then with respect to where the intangible income should be taxed, I do think there's an argument um, that goes all the way back to Alfred Marshall in the 1800s that both the supply and the demand side of the market, like two blades of a scissors, create value, right? So it does become a little bit of a political question. Um, you know, are you going to divide to supply and demand 50-50? because each blade is equally important or do we think that you know there's something special on the supply side and, and that is a is a highly contentious thing and i'm sure gabrielle has things to say too um i can try to answer uh danny's very important question on what's the optimal degree of uh, tax harmonization uh it's a difficult question but it's very important so the optimal tax harmonization is not full harmonization. I think we all agree with that, that there are legitimate reasons for countries to choose different corporate income tax rates. But at the same time, the optimal 
tax harmonization is not zero harmonization. And the problem is that with the, the, the current agreement, you know, because of the substance carve outs, essentially we are back to, to zero harmonization, meaning if a company has enough uh, activity in a, in a country and that country chooses a zero tax rate, then you know, essentially the profits will remain uh, tax free. So where should we you know, uh, be between zero harmonization and full harmonization? I think one useful way to think about this issue is to think a bit more deeply about what, what the corporate tax does. And in many ways, you have to think of the corporate tax as a kind of a minimum tax on the very rich. Because the very rich, most of their income derives from owning shares in companies. And they can instruct their companies not to distribute dividends, and so they can avoid the individual income tax like that. But they cannot avoid the corporate income tax. You know, even if there's no dividend distribution, the company has to pay the corporate income tax. So if you think of the corporate tax as a kind of minimum tax on the super rich, then you know, I think it makes sense to say, well, the super rich probably shouldn't have a tax rate that's lower than other social groups. Or at least, you know, you, you don't want to have tax regressivity. You know, maybe you don't want progressivity, but at, as a minimum, you know, the effective tax rate shouldn't fall with income. And so that, I think, gives you some framework to think about, you know, the, the optimal uh, coordination. I think time for lunch. Thank, uh, or ne no, next sessions. Oh, sorry, sorry. Big mistake. Big mistake. Time for industrial policy. Thanks a lot.